How can we know whether the Quran is the Word of God? Well, the answer to that question is we would have to go to the Quran and study it carefully with an open mind, open heart, no bias, with a view toward determining whether it possesses the attributes of inspiration. Can we not take every book on the planet and lay them on a table, every book that claims to be of divine origin? You know, there's really not that many books that do that. There's a lot of books that talk about uh, religious things and spiritual things, but they don't claim to be the Word of God. There's very few that do that. Could we not set those on the table? The Buddhist Patakis, the Hindu Vedas, the, the Book of Mormon, the Quran, the Bible, and examine them logically and rationally and determine which of those, if any, possess characteristics that clearly authenticate its divine origin. I believe that's exactly what we can do. In fact, I would submit that all humans on the planet are ultimately obligated to do that. That is, we have to know the receptacle of God's Word in order to then study it, believe it, and obey it. So we've been looking at the Quran, specific incidents. We turn now to a subject that has literally thrilled multiple generations of human beings for over 3,000 years. We're talking about the story of Joseph. The Quran devotes an entire surah to the life of Joseph. Let me call your attention to some of the details of Joseph's life that are mentioned in the Quran and as it turns out are also mentioned in the Jewish legends, the Jewish folklore of the Talmud, but which are not mentioned in the Bible. Take for example the purpose of Joseph in going out in search of his brothers. According to Genesis 37:14, apparently Jacob was somewhat concerned about their safety and yet both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that he was actually going out for recreational purposes to spend some time recreating with his brothers. What about the identity of the alleged predator that the brothers concocted to try to convince their father that Joseph had been eaten by a wild beast? The Hebrew uses a generic term for simply a wild animal, but both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis get very specific about the species of this creature, he was a wolf. Who was it that retrieved Joseph from the pit into which he had been thrown by his brothers? According to Genesis 37, it was the brothers who pulled him out and sold him to the traveling caravan. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that it was actually a member of the caravan that stumbled onto the pit, saw the boy, and pulled him out. For what amount was Joseph sold by his brothers? 20 shekels of silver, very specific term used in the Hebrew. The Jewish rabbis in Tankuma Vayashev use that same expression, 20 shekels, but they add that this was in fact a very low price for a human, and that is precisely the detail that is repeated in the Quran. Why did Joseph not succumb to the advances of Potiphar's wife? In chapter 39 of Genesis, he said, so that he would not sin against God. Well, the way the Quran puts it is there was an argument of his Lord. It's not until you go to the Jewish rabbis and find out that Joseph experienced a vision in which he saw his parents warning him not to submit to this woman's advances. So he received a supernatural argument that was posed by his parents. That coincides very specifically with the Quran's account. Was Joseph actually tempted to give in to Potiphar's wife's advances. No, there is no indication of that in the Bible. He consistently spurned her. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that he was in fact tempted and would have succumbed if it had not been for that vision or argument from the Lord. What happened to the garment that he was wearing on that last occasion when she made advances toward him? You remember the Bible says that he turned to run from her. She grabbed a hold of his outer tunic and pulled on it when he felt the tug, he, he allowed it to slip off of his uh, arms and, and he left the household while she uh, kept the article of clothing intact. The Quran says it was torn from behind. The Jewish rabbis say that it was torn in the front, but when the case went to court, this is uh, described in Midrash Haggadol. When it went to court, the uh, judges reasoned that, hey, if, if the tear is in the front, then she's telling the truth. He was attacking her. 
But if the tear is in the back, he's telling the truth. She was go coming after him. So uh, the rabbi said God miraculously caused the tear to move from the front around to the back, which then coincides with the Quran's account, which, by the way, as always, uh, has much less detail than you have in the Jewish rabbis. What was Potiphar's attitude toward Joseph on this occasion? Well, he was angry. He was upset because he believed his wife's story that he was making advances toward her. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis said that, no, as a matter of fact, Potiphar believed that Joseph was innocent. He believed he was telling the truth, but he felt that he had to go along with the story of his wife so that there would be no uh, problem with his heirs uh, and attaching you know, his, his, their mother's attitude or mother's actions in any way harming their condition, their reputation. Did anyone come to Joseph's defense? No, there was no one. And yet both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate there was an in-house witness. The Jewish rabbis elaborate. They say it was actually an infant child of Potiphar's wife who miraculously spoke from the crib and chastised his mother for her behavior. Was anything said in the Bible about Jacob instructing his sons as to how they were to enter uh, the, the city in Egypt to which they were going. Now, there's no, no indication there, but both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis have Jacob instructing the sons not to all bunch up and enter the city at the same gate, but in fact to spread out and enter by different gates. Did Jacob at any point suspicion that perhaps Joseph was alive in Egypt? Absolutely not. He believed he was in fact dead and his grief nearly caused his own death. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that he had an inkling that, in fact, he was alive. Did uh, Joseph reveal himself first to Benjamin and then to all the brothers when they came down into Egypt? No, he revealed himself to all of the brothers together. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that first he revealed himself privately to Benjamin, told Benjamin to remain quiet about it until he was ready to reveal his identity to all of the brothers. Why did Joseph sit in prison longer than uh, you would have expected him to, having interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. Well, the butler that survived that simply forgot. He, he owned up to it and said, I, I've made a mistake here. But both the Quran and the Jewish rabbis indicate that there was a miraculous intervention that caused the butler to forget. The Jewish rabbis say it was God. The Quran say that it was Satan, but notice the parallel between the two, it being miraculous. What was said when the silver chalice of Joseph was found in the luggage of the youngest? Well, in the Bible, there's an indication that the guilty would pay, he would be taken back into town, but both the Jewish rabbis and the Quran use a proverb that was common at the time, or the idea of, you know, you would expect a, the, a son of a thief to act like uh, his parent. These are details that are very specific in which the Jewish folklore and the Quran coincides. Let's uh, read a little bit from the Quran regarding this incident. The women in the city said, the ruler's wife is asking of her slave boy an ill deed. Indeed, he has smitten her to the heart with love. We behold her in plain aberration. And when she heard of their sly talk, she sent to them and prepared for them a cushioned couch, Muhammad Pickthall adds, to lie on at the feast, and gave to every one of them a knife, and said to Joseph, Come out unto them. And when they saw him, they exalted him, and cut their hands, exclaiming, Allah blameless, this is not a human being, this is no other than some gracious angel. She said, This is he on whose account ye blame me. I ask of him an evil act, but he proved continent. When you read this account in the Quran, you cannot help but have a question. Why in the world did Potiphar's wife give the women knives, and why did they then cut their hands? It's as if the author is speaking to an audience that he knows is familiar with the details of this story. It's as if the author failed to anticipate a future audience who would be unable to make sense of the background details because they're simply a lack of specificity. Well, our questions are answered when we go to the Jewish Talmud. A number of Talmudic sources allude to this incident. Let's read from the Jewish Talmud. The Jewish Talmud actually tells us that Potiphar's wife 
uh, had as her name Zuleika. Read this with me. When Zuleika could not prevail upon him to persuade him, her desire threw her into a grievous sickness. This woman was lovesick, according to the Jewish rabbis. And all the women of Egypt came to visit her, and they said unto her, Why art thou so languid and wasted, thou that lackest nothing? Is not thy husband a prince, great and esteemed in the sight of the king? Is it possible that thou canst want aught of what thy heart desires? Zuleika answered them, saying, This day shall it be made known unto you, whence cometh the state wherein you see me. She commanded her maidservants to prepare food for all the women. She spread a banquet before them in her house. She placed knives upon the table to peel the oranges, and then ordered Joseph to appear arrayed in costly garments and wait upon her guests. When Joseph came in, the women could not take their eyes off him, and they all cut their hands with the knives, and the oranges in their hands were covered with blood, but they, not knowing what they were doing, continued to look upon the beauty of Joseph without turning their eyes away from him. Now we got the whole story. <laughs> now we can understand what's going on in the Quran. You can read the Quran from one end to the other, and you'd never make sense of this story. Now we know that the Jewish rabbis claim that she gave them knives as part of the place setting to peel their oranges, and that as they began to peel their oranges, Joseph came in and they looked up and they were so dazzled by his youthful beauty that they accidentally cut themselves, caused themselves to bleed. It takes the Jewish folklore to give us the broader picture to even make sense of what was being referred to in the Quran. We continue reading. Then Zuleika said unto them, what have you done? Behold, I set oranges before you to eat, and you have cut your hands. All the women looked at their hands, and lo, they were full of blood, and it flowed down and stained their garments. They said to Zuleika, This slave in thine house did enchant us. We could not turn our eyes away from him on account of his beauty. She then said, This happened to you that looked upon him but a moment, and you could not refrain yourselves. How then can I control myself in whose house he abideth continually, who see him go in and out day after day. How then should I not waste away or keep from languishing on account of him? And the women spake, saying, It is true, who can look upon this beauty in the house and refrain her feelings? But he is thy slave. Why dost thou not disclose to him that which is in thy heart, rather than suffer thy life to perish through this thing? Zuleika answered them, Daily do I endeavor to persuade him, but he will not consent to my wishes. I promised him everything that is fair. Yet have I met with no return from him, and therefore I am sick, as you may see. It's interesting to me that if you read through the, the uh, Talmudic sources, it's like a soap opera. I mean, the rabbis go on and on ad nauseum about how, how lovesick uh, Zuleika was, even to the point of offering uh, to put out a contract on her husband's life if Joseph would consent to running off with her afterwards. Well, you see, the Quran draws in some of these um, fables, some of these obvious um, stories that were concocted by men. There's not anything in the Bible about this. When you take these two accounts and lay them down side by side, the Quran's account of Joseph and the Jewish folklore, and begin to compare them and draw points of comparison, it is astounding how much detail fits hand in glove between the two. I've listed for you several of these. For example, in both accounts, Potiphar's wife tries to justify her lovesick condition to the women. She does so by inviting them to a banquet. Then each woman is given a knife as part of the table place setting. Then she orders Joseph to make an appearance. Then when he comes into their presence, he's so handsome that the women cut their hands with the knives and then the women verbally state, ah, we see what you mean, he is really good looking. Then Potiphar's wife verbalizes her sense of exoneration, see, I told you so, and then verbally reaffirms to them that she has attempted repeatedly to seduce him, and yet he has absolutely refused to consent to her overtures. Notice there's, there's a minimum of nine very specific details that are not in the Bible, 
They are in the Quran. Well, you know, Muslims say, well, sure, because the Quran is the Word of God. It's giving you additional information. Wait a minute. All of these little minute details are also in the Talmud, the Jewish sources, and the rabbis claim they made this stuff up. This is legend. This is not inspired material from God. May I suggest to you that the author of the Quran acquired source material from the stories that he heard the Jews tell that actually owe their ultimate origin to the folklore found in the Talmud. Let me give you another instance or two of this kind of thing in the Quran. There's a lot of it in there. You know, after the New Testament came to a close, after the first century closed, Jesus had left the earth, gone back to heaven. The New Testament was completed and written by the close of the first century. Do you know immediately thereafter there, there began to be the production of apocryphal books and pseudepigrapha, books that, that were uninspired books written by mere men. Many times they were written to fill in gaps, what they perceived to be gaps in the life of Christ. You know, the, for example, the New Testament tells us that uh, Jesus was born. Only Matthew and Luke tell us that. They're the only ones that record the birth of Christ. Uh, Mark and John say nothing of that. And then uh, Luke gives us one incident in the childhood of Christ at the age of 12, Luke chapter 2. Otherwise, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four men selected by God to be for all time the inspired writers that, that gave to the world the life of Christ on earth, all four of them are virtually silent about the first 30 years of Christ's life on earth, with the exception, as I said, of the two that mention the birth, and one of those mentions an incident at age 12. Otherwise, the Bible has nothing to say about the, the infancy of Christ, the, the uh, toddling years of Christ, you know, the terrible twos, uh, what he was like as a teenager. It's silent about all that. Do you see that that is one of the proofs that the Bible's inspired as opposed to all other books? It's omissions are omissions that mere humans would not have omitted. But God selected, the Holy Spirit selected, guided those men to divulge only what God wanted released. That's proof of inspiration. But this body of Christian mythology developed very shortly after the first century, probably even started during the first century. And this material began to be told in Christian circles. And unquestionably, the author of the Quran would have accessed this material as those who claim to be representing Christianity, though obviously corrupt forms of it, crisscross the Arabian Peninsula. Take, for example, the seven sleepers of Ephesus. This is a mythological account that we, we don't have time to go through, but it's alluded to very specifically in the Quran. What about Jesus' conduct as a child? Incidents from the apocryphal books that claim to be reporting things that occurred in Jesus' life let me call your attention to a couple of these. This account is found in the Arabic, notice that, Arabic gospel of the infancy of the Savior. So far as scholars can tell, this was written in the second century A.D. Let me point out to you once again, this predated Muhammad's life by a couple of centuries. And yet here we are told, here's an English translation, when the Lord Jesus was seven years of age, He was on a certain day with other boys, his companions, about the same age, who, when they were at play, made clay into several shapes, namely asses, oxen, birds, and other figures, each boasting of his work and endeavoring to exceed the rest. Then the Lord Jesus said to the boys, I will command these figures, which I have made, to walk. And immediately they moved. And when he commanded them to return, they returned. He had also made the figures of birds and sparrows, which, when He commanded to fly, did fly. And when He commanded to stand still, did stand still. Let me show you another apocryphal book. This is called the Gospel of Thomas. Folks, these are not inspired books. They do not belong in the biblical canon of books. This is from Gospel of Thomas chapter 1. Then He took from the bank of the stream some soft clay, this referring to Jesus, and formed out of it twelve sparrows, and there were other boys playing with him. Then Jesus, clapping together the palms of his hands, 
called to the sparrows and said to them, Go, fly away, and while ye live, remember me. So the sparrows fled away, making a noise. Did that actually happen? Absolutely not. That's Christian folklore. That's a legend that was made up in the very early centuries of Christianity by obviously curious humans that want to try to fill in the gaps where the Bible does not record the events of Jesus' life. But guess what? When you go to the Quran, specifically Surah 3, notice this account beginning in verse 45. And he will teach him, this is Allah speaking and referring to Jesus, he will teach him the scripture and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel and will make him a messenger unto the children of Israel, saying, Lo, I come unto you with a sign from your Lord. Lo, I fashion for you out of clay the likeness of a bird, and I breathe into it, and it is a bird by Allah's leave. Moving over to Surah 5, when Allah saith, O Jesus, son of Mary, remember my favor unto thee and unto thy mother, how I taught thee the scripture and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. And how thou did shape of clay, as it were, the likeness of a bird, by my permission. And didst blow upon it, and it was a bird, by my permission. My suggestion to you is, the Quran's account is in fact from an uninspired apocryphal legend. That is the source of the Quran's claim that Jesus made clay birds and brought them to life. It smacks of fable. It smacks of mythology. The Bible contains no such material. So to give credence to this outlandish tale further demonstrates the human origin of the text of the Quran. Let me give you a few other problems that the Quran manifests. And I if you look in a book that I've written on this subject, there's so much more to document this. It's so overwhelming, there's so much of it. So let me call your attention to another uh, item. As I was reading through the Quran, I began to notice that over and over and over, when Jesus is referred to, He is called the Son of Mary. And it became very repetitious. Jesus, Son of Mary. Jesus, Son of Mary. It became so repetitious that it caught my attention. And so I did a quick search and found that 22 times in the Quran, when Jesus is alluded to, you have that little appellation tacked on there, Son of Mary. Jesus, Son of Mary. Well, I became curious. That's kind of an odd way to refer to Jesus. That is, it had an unfamiliar ring to me. It didn't sound familiar having read the Bible. So I went to the Bible, went to the New Testament. How many times is Jesus identified in the New Testament? You know, frequently identified as the Son of God or the Lord. A number of uh, expressions and labels used. But what about Son of Mary? Well, I found it. It occurred one time. But it did not come from the mouth of Allah. It didn't come from God. Nor did Jesus ever use that expression to refer to Himself. It came from the townspeople where Jesus grew up. They said, wait, isn't this, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary? So the Bible never alludes to Jesus that way. So I'm forced to conclude that the author of the Quran got it in his mind that he had, in listening to Christians, as he understood them to be, these Christians often referred to Mary as having an inflated role in the life of Jesus. And he heard this expression and assumed, mistakenly, that the form of Christianity to which he had been exposed was an accurate biblical form. Well, what form of Christianity would Muhammad have been exposed to in the 6th and 7th century A.D.? Well, by this time, Catholicism had spread and one of the prominent features of Catholicism is Mariolatry, the worship of Mary, characterizing Mary's importance in a way and to an extent that the Bible itself does not portray. That's another indication of the Quran's own problems. 
Here is a standard Muslim response to what we've looked at today. Well, the Bible has been corrupted. The Quran is correct. The Jewish rabbis happened to get it right. Probably they stole it from the Quran. The Bible's corrupted. Well, you know, that is a wild charge. And anyone who makes that charge obviously has not examined the evidence because the evidence is decisive. The Bible is the best attested book from antiquity. We know how the original New Testament books read because we have three surviving classes of evidence by which to go back and reconstruct the original New Testament and know that we have it as it came from the pens of the inspired writers. We have Greek manuscripts. We have ancient versions. We have patristic citations. Do you know that the current number of Greek manuscript copies that contain all or part of the New Testament, some of which date back all the way to the second century within just a handful of years at the close of the period of inspiration? We have well over 5,000 such manuscripts, fragments, and so forth. Over 5,700. There's no other book on the planet that is of antiquity that has all that massive amount of textual information by which to know how the Bible originally read. It is true that variant readings exist in manuscripts, but even those do not alter any basic teaching of the New Testament. It is unquestionably documented that we have the New Testament and no feature of Christian doctrine is at stake. Listen to Westcott and Hort who were experts in Greek who spent uh, their entire lives examining uh, the textual data that, that verifies the authenticity of the text of the New Testament. They said the words, in our opinion, still subject to doubt, can hardly amount to more than a thousandth part of the New Testament. So they were saying we can confidently affirm we have the evidence that verifies that 999 one-thousandths of the original New Testament is intact. And the remaining one-thousandth, they know exactly what those points are, and they are inconsequential points. They have nothing to do ultimately with doctrine. Let us draw these conclusions. Number one, it is self-evident and unmistakable that the Quran contains a considerable amount of borrowed material from uninspired Talmudic sources, rabbinical oral traditions, and Jewish legends. Number two, an occasional link between two sources might be explainable on legitimate grounds that would refute the charge of collusion. However, the Quran's reliance on uninspired Jewish sources is extensive and very specific. Number three, the author of the Quran demonstrated considerable ignorance of the Bible, but a striking acquaintance with Jewish legends. Number four, Muhammad likely had very little, if any, contact with the actual Bible. Muslims themselves say he couldn't read. Therefore, his contact with the Bible was dependent on the representations presented to him by the Jews. But sadly, the Jews seem to be more enamored with rabbinic folklore and legend rather than in actually expounding the biblical text Consequently, in detail after detail, where the Quran differs with the Bible, it coincides with the Jewish legends that were current in Muhammad's day. The parallels between the Quran and Jewish legends are of such a nature that it is apparent to the unbiased observer that the Jewish legends provide the context to items that the Quran otherwise leaves inexplicable and undecipherable. So we conclude as kindly as we can. The Quran does not possess the attributes of divine inspiration. In fact, the Quran possesses characteristics that verify its human origin. If you appreciate this seminar on Islam and the Quran, you will want to read the book on which it was based, The Quran Unveiled. This volume gives a great deal of additional information not included in the DVD seminar. Also available are study guides that supplement your viewing of the DVD. 
The study guides, the book, as well as additional copies of the DVD may all be purchased at apologeticspress.org or by calling toll-free 800-234-8558.